So, uh, first of all, yeah, thank y'all uh, for letting me come. I, I've been a, a long time uh, fan of these talks. <laughs> I watched a lot of them uh, on YouTube and now I get to, to join some, some very distinguished uh, company. Um, you know, uh, a few things you're you're not going to see or hear from me today will be millions and millions of slides on the history of value investing or the mechanics of a DCF. You know, there's there's actually very little uh, out there that's new in the value investing world <laughs> since Ben Graham wrote The Intelligent Investor and Warren Buffett wrote his uh, Berkshire shareholder letters. And there's plenty of, you know, great textbooks out there on a lot of the the mechanics and details, and I'm sure you're learning a lot of those things right now at Ivy. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, a little bit about Southeastern, what we feel makes us unique, and then talk some about value investing, and then have plenty of time at the end uh, for, for questions. So here's the all-important disclosures page. You have now viewed it. Um, so partnership investing is a very important term to us, just partnership in general. Um, and we've got a few uh, numbers on this page that, that detail that. So we are 100% employee owned. Maybe even more important than that is we are required to put 100% of our equity investments into our own funds. So there, that's why you can see later down here where our own largest client, uh, because we've just been eating our own cooking for a very long time. Um, and we feel that it's strange that there's still investors out there who, who don't take that approach, uh, but we, we want to be right there with our clients, um, paying the same fees and winning or losing right alongside of them. Uh, three generations. Um, that means uh, our, our founder, Mason Hawkins, who is still the chairman of Southeastern, he founded our, our company in 1975 uh, in the wake of the the nifty 50 crash. Um, he is, uh, George and I were just talking, he's definitely uh, still still highly in, involved and we talk all the time. Uh, Staley Cates uh, has been our, our president and is now our vice chairman and he's getting to do what he loves to do most now, which is be a research analyst and he's found many great stocks and, you know, continues to do that every day. Um, and now we have a, a somewhat newer generation. Um, me and others, and I've, I've been at uh, the company, as Luke said, for over 15 years now. Uh, there's that 1.5 billion number, which is when you are putting your own money in there and you've been doing it for generations at Compounds, and we hope to keep doing that for the future. And again, because we're our own largest client, we can really ask ourselves every day, what would we do with our own money? And uh, the way that we run Southeastern is not some fee-seeking game, or it's not trying to chase hot products, it's just trying to deliver great absolute returns for the long term. Uh, we feel like we've built up a, a great roster of clients who, who think similarly to how we do. As you can see there, 17 years is the average tenure of our like-minded client base, and we're very grateful for them. And that lets us think long-term, getting to this five plus year investment horizon. You know, we use the term time arbitrage, where because we don't have to, to, to overly focus on next quarter, last quarter, we can take that long-term view, build long-term value per share, help our management teams, investees do that, and everybody wins in the long run. On to the next page, I'll just be kind of brief here. These are some numbers on us. Um, you know, Luke had said 13 billion earlier. Unfortunately, that was a pre-COVID uh, and <laughs> another year of rough value investing times number. But again, we're, we're not going anywhere. And uh, because uh, enough of it is our own money, we're going to be involved in doing it if we're the last ones standing. So um, moving on to this next page, um, George very helpfully sent over uh, a lot of questions that he suggested I talk about, and I'm grateful for that to, to have a roadmap um, to guide us on here. Um, I am not going to go one through nine um, in order, but I hope that everything I say will will address a lot of this. Um, and I will get on into it in the next slide or two here. So the first kind of bucket of questions, one, two, five, six, and seven, 
can be answered by seven words that you hear from us all the time. You've probably already uh, seen us put them in print or, or heard us say them if you've, you've checked us out previously. Um, and they are uh, the first four, long-term, concentrated, engaged, and value. So these words have been guiding us uh, for a very long time, 45 years plus. Um, you know, the long term, which is at the top here, as I already mentioned, we have a very long holding period. You know, the average amount of time that a stock is held is less than a year or so. And uh, so you can check our turnover and see that we we really do hold things um, long. We held, for example, FedEx since stock since the 1980s. Um, we'd always rather get paid sooner, but we're not going to lose our patience about it. Um, and we also, you know, again, because our firm has been around so long, people uh, can judge us by our track record and they know that we'll hopefully uh, do what we say we're going to do. Concentrated. Um, you can see here, uh, I already talked about why our company is concentrated because we're 100% owners of it and required to put all of our money uh, and equity investing into it. But it, when we build our portfolios and some of this stuff, I'm sure you all have already uh, learned at school is that mathematically, if you're picking com companies across different industries, you can usually get the proper amount of diversification from a number of holdings that's somewhere in the teens. Um, and, you know, we own a little bit more than that because there'll usually be some overlap. And we're also open to more highly concentrated accounts. Um, if a particular client has, you know, other people managing money for them and would just like our best ideas. But also the other end of the mathematical spectrum is when you start owning much more than 30, 40 stocks, then mathematically you're starting to look a lot more like the index. And when you get to that point, uh, the point of active management um, and the benefits from it become diminished. And we don't wanna be that either. So we'll always have a very high uh, active share. Uh, engaged. Um, Luke already mentioned that a little bit. Um, so on the one end of the spectrum, you've got passive investing, just own the index. And that has some virtues, certainly, you know, especially in the early days uh, when, when, when Boggle uh, started things in that world. Um, but there's also kind of passive active investors, which we don't understand often why that approach is taken. Um, we, you know, <laughs> because our, as I already said, we're concentrated and we're putting a lot of eggs into one basket. But the second part of that quote is usually watch that basket. Well, we just don't wanna watch it. We wanna you know, help, it, help it grow and keep it safe. Um, so being engaged with managements uh, achieves that. Now being a big A activist investor where every time you invest into something, you start off loud day one um, thinking you're going to change it for the better. We'd rather have a middle course there where a lot of the times we're just working with management behind the scenes, asking them tough questions, holding them accountable, but also, you know, cheering them on when they do great things. And the best way to, to make money over the long term is to partner with great people and great businesses. But sometimes when there are things that we can do, do to improve the situation, we'll do that. We filed 13 Ds. We voted against people on proxies. We'll write letters if we need to. Um, but, you know, again, a long track record of, in the long run, being there to, to help all shareholders. Finally, uh, we've got value, um, which is a word near and dear, I'm sure, to a lot of y'all. Um, as it says here, we want to own high-quality businesses run by capable people at a discounted price. Those three words in italics are the next slide where we talk about each of them. Um, as you can see here, you know, um, the words business people and price are in that order for a very good reason. You know, um, we want to start first with the great business. Uh, how do we define that? You know, as we write here, we want a high quality company, sustainable competitive advantage, strong balance sheet, and expected free cash flow growth. Um, you know, of course, a lot of people want that. So, so you got to take it down another level or two. And really the best way to talk through all of these things on this page are through specific examples, which we'll, we'll do some of later. But, you know, when we look at other things that make a business great, you know, we want to see a demand tailwind. You know, do customers want more of this product? 
it's a kind of basic question, but it's very important, especially when you want to avoid a value trap. Number two, you know, how is this industry structured? Is it is it rational competition? Um, does a company have a, a good degree of control over its own outcome? Or is it a counterproductive kind of free for all or, you know, a potentially dangerously regulated zone? You know, just how, how is that industry structured and is it getting better or worse? That's very important. Um, return on capital, return on equity is a very important metric. Um, but what we're focused most on on that is the return on incremental capital in the future. Less so kind of a backwards look at ROE because that's the past and the value of the company will be determined by the future. Um, so we'll, we'll talk some more about judging a business later. On the people side of things, it's important here. We want management who act like owners and are focused on prudently growing long-term value per share via intelligent capital allocation and just being good, solid business people and good people, you know, that you want to partner with. Now, we wrote act like owners because sometimes you can have owners who don't care enough about long-term shareholder returns. Um, so that kind of gets to ways that we'll evaluate that. I mean, certainly, and you know, hopefully in a lot of cases, we can look at a long-term track record. Has this person grown value per share? Have they done intelligent things? Has the stock price responded accordingly over a long time frame? Um, you know, often we get to partner with people when they are misunderstood temporarily themselves. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're, they, we're there when they need us most. And then when they're on the cover of the magazine or something, we're, we're on to the next one. Um, but, but other ways we can, can gauge that alignment. First, you know, will be how are they paid? How are they compensated? We're, we're generally looking for three things there. Um, is some kind of metric on free cash flow per share over the long run? That's important. Another kind of metric on return on capital and if that's going up or down, as I just mentioned earlier, judging a business. And then something on total stockholder return over the long term. Again, you know, this is not like next quarter, last quarter stock price, but are these people growing the, the, the stockholder returns over the long term? And then the board, the board of the company is extremely important. We want to read every one of these people's bios. Hopefully we'll know them. That's one of the great things about us having been around for a long time, 45 plus years. We've built up a network of current clients, past clients, current investees, past investees, just people we know, you know, all over uh, the world who probably will know some of these people. And that's the best kind of insight. And of course, we'll go meet them and talk to them and, and, and see see uh, what they have to say to hopefully some some hard and, and long-term focused questions. All right, finally, price here. I could probably talk the most about this one um, just because, uh, you know, there's more words on this page devoted to, to other things. Doesn't mean that, you know, we've stopped caring about price. Um, price will always be extremely important. We will always be real value investors. Um, it's tempting, you know, this this long into a period where value has had a tough go of it to just kind of want to own those those compounders that seem like they grow their stock price no matter what. They're great companies, often run by great people, but we need that margin of safety too. And, you know, the way that we do that generally is determining a value by a discounted free cash flow method where we take the unlevered free cash flow of a company just kind of back over a period of years, add the cash, subtract the debt, add any other non-earning assets in there, divide it by the shares, and there's a number. Now, there's not really any fancy math in there <laughs> that you couldn't do before you got to college. Um, we don't want to make it any more complex than it has to be. But even still, you know, you can make a DCF say a lot of things. So we want checks on that. We want to see where comparable M&A transactions in the industry have happened. We want to see where comparable public companies trade uh, in the market. We want to see what replacement cost is. We just want multiple ways to appraise a company, just like if you were you know, appraising a house in a neighborhood, um, they don't use just one method either. Uh, and then we're going to stay disciplined versus that valuation and try to pay a big discount to it. Generally two-thirds or less. This the P to V in the 60s, as the slide says. So so that's that's on price. And every business must meet quantitative and qualitative criteria here, these three. 
of course, sometimes it's more of a strong two and the other one, you know, is, you know, good, but not as great as the other two. That's all right. And we can maybe work and see if, if, if that one out of three can improve, but by and large, we're, we're, we're getting all three and we're staying patient and working for those. On to the next one here. Um, this is kind of some details on, on how we do it. Our, our team, you know, we're a team of, of almost 15 analysts here. Um, one of the things that's changed at Southeastern a lot over the last 20 plus years is we built out a much more global team where, you know, originally we were founded in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, that's where I'm coming to you from right now in my kid's bedroom. Um, but, you know, eventually over time, we have built out offices and teams of, of locals and, um, you know, people who have deep experience in these specific regions, you know, our London office in Europe, our Singapore office in Asia. Um, you know, that's the kind of uh, uh, stuff that, that takes time to build, but it's, it's very valuable and very important to have a team like this um, because, you know, having a, a great team really lets you have good debate. We're all generalists here. Um, so we're not in specialist silos where people are talking past each other or where people can't be effective devil's advocates on different names. Being generalists also um, keeps us disciplined because if you're, you know, a specialist guy, say following the, the automobile industry, you're probably going to always want to say we should own a car stock. Sometimes we shouldn't. Sometimes we should own more than one. Generalists can go to where the opportunities are and then they can kind of stay away from where the opportunities aren't. Um, and, you know, putting a little more math on the team here and why it's, you know, about 15 of us and not 10 of us or, or 30 of us. So when we look around the world, we have what we call our master list. It's the companies, the public companies that we would love to own at the right price. There are a little under, I'd say a thousand or so of those in each of the Americas, Europe, and Asia. And you could probably consider that the cheapness or attractiveness on price of those will be determined roughly, you know, via normal distribution. Um, so of that 2,500, 3,000 or so, if you consider that each analyst on the team should be able to look at at least one or two companies each week in enough detail to get evaluation, and that work is good for at least a year or two, you can see how we can be covering uh, the cheap half, the attractive half of, of that bell curve. Um, said another way, you know, because we have um, a few different uh, fund strategies, as I talked about earlier, we're only going to be owning, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 stocks at any given moment. Um, therefore, if you think about each analyst is doing a great job if they find one or two new ideas each year, because these, these 20 stock portfolios only, you know, have, have a five-year turnover. Um, then you can multiply, you know, 10, 10 to 15 analysts times one to two times five, and you get that number of stocks roughly that we own uh, currently. So, so there's, there's the team. Um, let's head on to the next one. So I've been saying a lot of stuff probably that you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But so doesn't everybody want to do this? Like, why, <laughs> why isn't everybody out there value investing, right? Who wouldn't want all these great things? And the answer to why everyone doesn't really want this is that, and this answers George's remaining questions, hopefully, is that human emotions uh, get in the way. And they get in the way for most people, but hopefully they work in our favor uh, over the long run. And that's, that's what I'll talk about uh, for, for a little bit here. So um, let's see, uh, this slide here, it's got a lot going on. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of talking about what's, what's been going on in the market lately. Um, and markets were, <laughs> were very volatile last year. You know what, they've been volatile before, will be volatile many times again. But the thing is that values, true underlying values, rarely change as dramatically as stock prices do. And that's our opportunity. So you look at the box over here on the left, momentum on fire. You've seen 
lots of tech stocks, alternative energy. We've even got SPACs and IPOs in the mix again. And uh, those things have been on fire <laughs> lately. And we don't own much or <laughs> really anything uh, there. Um, the market volatility index, the VIX in the middle there is a measure of how much uh, things have been and will be potentially moving around. We had some very high levels there last year and now it's it's abated somewhat but it's just it's just telling um how how quickly things can change finally over on the far right um you know you've got the the big benchmark index s p 500 um the the different weightings by sector there um you know that would look very different in 1980 or in 1950 and certainly information technology, there's many wonderful things that's enabling this Zoom. But again, price will matter. <laughs> and we feel like um, some of the more out of the way parts of this index are where the best prices are. And we feel like uh, a lot of quality is as well. So, so this is kind of what's been, been going on and should probably be asking, well, well, why? Why can't the market just kind of calm down and, and take a sensible view of things over the long run. Um, I've got some, some pretty fancy math on the next page to talk about why not. There you go. Um, so I don't know how much y'all are familiar with the concept of loss aversion. And this has been studied by many psychologists and duplicated in plenty of studies that basically losses are quote felt about twice as much as winners are felt. And therefore, <laughs> uh, the logical conclusion of that is that concentrated investing is almost mathematically guaranteed to feel bad. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to take because when we kind of step back, if we're right three out of five times with our, with our picks, then we're doing a great job. Uh, especially if those winners are stronger than our losers. But so many times, um, the, the way that this is perceived by the market is that all of the questions are about, you know, the two losers. And because they're felt twice as much, you've got four units of bad feelings versus three units of good feelings. This is why people want to hug that index. And this is one of the main reasons for what we call career risk, which is, um, you know, it's a real killer to sensible long-term investing because people are afraid of looking different from that index. They're afraid of making a bold choice because they're afraid of getting fired. And I get it, you know, that's, that's a big thing to be afraid of, but it's not how you make great investment decisions for the long-term. Um, so, you put all that stuff together to some of George's questions on how you build a portfolio. I figured I'd, I'd show you here what our kind of normal global portfolio looked like at uh, December 31st of, of 2020. Um, you know, you can see here how different it looks versus the index. We have starting over on the far right, a lot less United States um, than than the index because we think the United States is is priced very highly, you know, high multiples on high margins. Um, we don't have a strange love of the Netherlands. That's just where a company or two of ours happens to be headquartered, like Exor, uh, which is our largest holding. Um, Hong Kong, somewhat similar with CK Hutchison, uh, an important holding there, but it's actually uh, more of a um, uh, you know we feel a global blue chip conglomerate. Um, then you head on over to the sector weights where, you know, those first few bars were kind of looking a little bit like that. That's not a top-down decision. These are all bottom-up decisions driven by stocks that we want to own for the long term. Um, then you start getting into the bottom part of this chart and we look dramatically different than the index. Um, we do not have any IT at the moment. Um, we owned Alphabet uh, for for five years, um, actually, and, and but we just sold it last year because we felt that price exceeded value. Um, healthcare, we would love to own a healthcare stock at the right price, but we just haven't been able to 
to find any uh, until until the you know as of the December 31st cutoff there. Um, consumer staples. Um, these are the kind of stocks that grow with this straight ruler type growth. And as I was mentioning earlier, people will often look back at their past return on equity and say, oh, these are great investments and they pay a dividend and these are safe things to own. And, you know, that's, there's a lot of truth to that, but safety is driven most by paying a low price uh, on something that you understand. That's, that's the safe thing, having that margin of safety. Uh, between price and value. And we've owned consumer staples before, we'll own them again. Um, but uh, at the moment, you know, less less for us to do there. And then you see down at the very bottom, cash. Cash for us is the residual of a lack of, of great ideas at any given moment. It's not a top-down, hey, we're going to cash, we want to be this percent cash. It's more just kind of, uh, you know, the, the store for the next uh, the next few ideas that we'll own. And that cash can go quickly, you know, like that. Uh, when markets turn our way and we buy a few new ideas and boom, that cash is fully invested. And that's what we'd prefer. We prefer to own great companies with great people at a discount instead of holding cash. But we're not afraid to do it either. But it sure makes you look different than the index. And it can make you, you know, feel not great when the market just kind of goes up every day, no matter what. Um, so, you know, these are our holdings. Um, you know, XOR as an example of one at the moment on business people price, um, on the business side of things, it's really hard to put it into a box <laughs> in one industry. And one siloed sell side analyst or specialist would have a very hard time with this company because it's a few different discrete assets. It's got Partner Re, which is a global reinsurance company. Um, you know, reinsurance is a good, solid business over the long run as you know, Brem Watson and Warren Buffett have showed the world, uh, but it sure doesn't grow in a straight line. It shouldn't grow in a straight line and for easy to understand quarterly earnings. Um, but we think that's one of the reasons XOR is attracted to it and is a good fit with it. Uh, then there's a few other assets they have. They own a, a large stake in C&H, uh, the world number two tractor company behind John Deere. That company will soon also be splitting into separate parts probably. Uh, they own a large stake in Ferrari. I think everybody knows um, Ferrari and that stock is loved by the market. It's uh, trading at a, a very high multiple, um, but we we get to own it within XOR uh, because you know the market isn't giving XOR full credit. Also owns a stake in what was formerly Fiat Chrysler, now has the jazzy new corporate name of Stellantis. Um, but we think there's a lot of good, good synergies, actual synergies, <laughs> real synergies are rare, but we think we've got some here and great leadership at that company under Carlos Tavares. Um, and then some other interesting assets. They own a, a good chunk of The Economist, uh, which I encourage y'all all to subscribe to, and uh, the Juventus soccer team, encourage y'all all to cheer them on. Um, and, and then just a good conservatively financed balance sheet. That's a lot of stuff that's hard to explain in a minute or so, <laughs> right? Before I've even gotten to the people side of the case, where the main attraction there is this guy named John Elkin, where um, he uh, is a younger guy. He is uh, from the Agnelli family in Italy. And 15 plus years ago, they were known for their ownership in Fiat, the car company, and Exor was viewed as an inferior way to own an inferior car company. <laughs> uh, but thanks to John's very hard work and long-term thinking over the years, um, helped along by Sergio Marchionne, who unfortunately passed away um, within the last few years, um, he has transformed this to now this kind of, um, you know, you could almost call it an early stage Berkshire Hathaway type, type company where they are willing to look across different industries and just focus on growing long-term value per share and they've built a steady, safe, diversified way to do that. And we're very excited to be alongside of them. And that's why it's our number one holding. And I could talk about all of the rest of these and please fire away with, with questions later. But, you know, we're also not afraid of overweighting our, our favorite ideas and, and underweighting those where we're either maybe on the way out or just on the way in. We've learned to take our time building our positions as well because that, uh, that helps with our risk control measures. So let's, uh, I think a good thing to do before we 
head on and talk about a specific one. Um, you know, we feel strongly about value investing and we've, uh, you know, again, 14 years into some rough times for value investing, feel more strongly about it than ever because that's the kind of tough times that set up good times coming, you know, which is uh, what matters most for the, for the future is what's going to happen uh, prospectively, not what's happened. What's happened builds up the opportunity, which is where we are today, which is why we, you know, we're not putting out a white paper every week or something, but we felt compelled last quarter to actually put pen to paper and say, you know, why we believe value will work again. And you can see it on our website. I'm not going to talk about it here. After you've kind of uh, heard what I've been saying, I bet you could imagine what it would say anyway. <laughs> but the gist of it numerically is that um, a lot of the uh, indexes that we compete with are at well above average multiples on well above average margins. Whereas the companies that we own are at well below average multiples on not peak margins. And what we own is, you know, under recognized as high quality, uh, you know, and and that's that's how we're going to get paid. And, and just putting again, some very simple math on it. If, you know, a market multiple trading at a very high teens up to 20 or so, goes back down to the mid to high teens and they have earnings disappointments, whereas our company's trading, you know, 10, 11 times free cash flow, um, go back up to just kind of a, a low teens number, which again would be below the long run market average. That's how we can be up 20%. They can be down 20%. And that's not what you see every day. Um, you know, this is a very unique time for value investing. Uh, versus other forms of investing. And that's why we keep doing it every day. And that's why we're very excited right now. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to kind of talk through a specific example um, before we get to your questions. And it's a little bit off the radar. It's one that we've, we've already closed out. Um, it is called Sonic. Um, this company, uh, is a, a U.S.-based uh, fast food restaurant, and I will talk about it some now. So, again, we'll, we'll do it through our familiar uh, view of business people price. So on the business side of things, this was an understandable branded company uh, with a franchising model that delivers a high return on capital. Um, it was this, you know, I don't know if, if any of y'all ever been to a Sonic, um, but it's this kind of unique drive-in concept where you pull up in your car, order it a kind of this booth type thing, and they bring the food out to you, and you can eat it in your car, you can take it home. Uh, it started in uh, what I wrote here, the South Central U.S., uh, which is Oklahoma, where they were founded. They ultimately grew to 3,500 plus of these across most states by the time we invested. Originally, it was this kind of hybrid model of owned stores and franchise stores, but they were transitioning more to a franchise model, which we liked, but which led to confusing accounting because there were, when there's owned and, and franchised, it's not a quote pure play, which the market likes more. So often confusing accounting is one of the things that attracts us. Uh, not that this one was super confusing, but it, again, it wasn't as easy as another one where you could just kind of slap a multiple on it and go on your way. Um, to the competitive advantage front and kind of how we, we came to understand this, um, you know, we think it had a unique brand. It was not like every other concept out there. It had a diverse menu that worked across different parts of the day. Um, that's unique, but, but more important than that was kind of, we just did our deep research. Um, there's this thing called a franchise disclosure document where, you can learn a lot about franchisee economics and it actually had all of the franchisees phone numbers in it. So we called all of them <laughs> and not all of them picked up or wanted to talk to us, but we sure tried. Um, and then we talked to competitors. Um, you know, we invested in McDonald's and Yum! Brands and Wendy's uh, previously, talked to all of them, learned what they had to say uh, about Sonic. Um, also talked to franchisees of, of other brands, you know, friend who's a Wendy's franchisee here. He had some very interesting thoughts on Sonic. I would actually go eat at Sonic, you know, take the kids and, and just learn about it. Um, 
you know, you, you want to get deep into these things. And, and that's, that's what we did. Um, on to the people side of things. Um, so Sonic's uh, CEO uh, was a guy named Cliff Hudson. Uh, he was, you know, we love partnering with owner founders. Cliff was almost that because he'd been at the company for about 30 years and deserved a large amount of credit for growing it, you know, more than 10 X uh, under his tenure. Um, and he'd been there for so long, you could just see his track record. Like, okay, here's what the total stockholder return has done while he's been there. Here's what book value per share has done while he's been there. Here's what he's done on capital allocation. No silly acquisitions, reasonable stock repurchase. Um, and so, you know, then we started asking some people we knew uh, in Oklahoma and elsewhere about him. We heard good things. Uh, we went to go meet him and we liked what we heard there. Um, you know, it's interesting, these in-person meetings, a lot of people would say, why do you go do that? You know, these management teams are just going to lie to you. Um, you're just going to get sold some story. And of course, you know, <laughs> shockingly, we, we've occasionally had people not tell us the truth. Um, but when you go to these meetings, you know, you get the truth more often than not. And maybe even more importantly, is kind of towards the end, you can ask them, well, you know, if you had to invest in one other company, uh, regardless of its price, what would that be? And you'll learn a very interesting thing or two from that and often get something interesting about, you know, maybe a strong moat company that you might not have known about otherwise. Actually, that was one of the things that turned us on to Sonic. Um, I was out in San Diego meeting the, the Jack in the Box management team. And I, we asked them that question and they started going on and on about Sonic. And I was like, well, let's, let's file that one away. And Sonic itself wasn't cheap at the time, but when it was, I was like, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, final thing on the situation was that Cliff himself was in the, his, his early 60s. And, and that's you know a time when often a, a manager, an executive will start thinking about what what do I want to leave behind here or or what what kind of you know hands should I leave this company in and it can be a good time to engage with them and and, and talk talk through that. On to price. Um, you know we uh, were attracted to a lot of things uh, about the price at Sonic. Uh, as it says here it traded at a low double digit multiple of free cash flow for what we felt was a strong branded growing high return company that had multiple ways to, to grow. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we as value investors rarely get to invest in something like that when it's readily apparent. Um, stock was out of favor uh, because they'd reported a few weak quarters. Sonic itself, because it's this weird kind of concept where you're, you know, um, often kind of sitting in your car there, weather is very important to it, you know, and if it's hot, dry weather, you're going to go to Sonic and get some drinks and ice cream. If it's not, you might not. Over the long run, of course, that, that evens out. Maybe it's even a good thing as the world gets hotter and drier. But um, in any given moment, you know, it could, it could rain that day or that month and mess up comparable sales. And they'd had a little bit of that. Also, you know, they, like all fast food restaurants, compete against McDonald's and McDonald's was uh, which we had actually bought a year or two earlier um, was was you know kind of reawakening and getting its groove back, and so everybody was scared what that could mean for for Sonic. Um, at the time we invested, our appraisal of Sonic was in the thirty five forty dollar a share range. Um, there were few few ways we got to that. Um, we just looked at okay, here is the franchise part of the business. We can see this growing mid single to high single digits from a mix of new stores that use other people's capital to open and therefore we get more of a royalty from them. Sonic also had this ascending royalty rate, which was a little bit unique, which would help growth. Uh, and then you could assume some, some comparable store sales growth would come back and all that could, could add up to over costs that were variable, but there was some fixed cost in there to, to that kind of growth that I just mentioned. Then you'd see what their own stores were worth add in the cash, subtract the debt. Um, that's how we got to that 35, 40 a share. Then, you know, um, that also, we want to check that against comparable transactions in the industry or where comparable companies trade. It seemed unlikely how this could be worth much less than 10 times EBITDA. Um, 
And on the high end, we could see it being worth the mid-teens on the EBITDA. Our value is kind of more in between there. And even with that, we thought we had a good, good margin of safety. So we started buying it for our small cap fund. And eventually we came to own over 15% of the company. So let's talk about what happened. Um, on the business, you know, as I mentioned earlier, time arbitrage was important because not much good happened <laughs> for a while. Um, comparable sales were weak for the majority of the time that we owned it. They were printed a negative quarter right after we invested and then had seven straight quarters that I would say were various degrees of disappointing. Um, before they finally turned positive after most short-term investors had, had given up. Um, they also continued to work through refranchising uh, their stores. It was a little bit disappointing how it turned out, but they got it done. They did have good cost control. And then we owned it while we had this big US tax cut, which also helped the reported free cash flow somewhat. Um, but let me tell you, back to the, the loss aversion and the feelings here, uh, you know, it didn't feel wonderful to, to own this stock uh, right out of the gate, uh, but that, that didn't deter us. Um, on the people side of things, Cliff did turn out to be a great partner, but, you know, it wasn't always easy. Um, one thing that was great was that they bought back shares at good prices throughout our ownership. But there was some some level of uncertainty around where the company was going to go. There have been a few executive changes. There were questions around um, the the brand and how strong it could be and how much this concept could work in a changing world, especially as they were working on a new app um, where it was going to lead to some different uh, consumer behaviors. Um, we thought it could be interesting, but it sure wasn't a slam dunk. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, after, you know, getting to, to know uh, the situation and the management team, we purchased our first shares in 2016. Um, in late 2017, as it says here, we collaborated and filed a 13D, which is an SEC document um, in the United States that lets you speak more freely with Sonic and other interesting parties. Um, that led to management starting a strategic review process um, <clears throat> where they looked around and considered their options. and. Here is what happened. So as you can see here, there was a whole lot of nothing uh, for, for, for a long time here. Um, and what that led to was, you know, again, we filed the 13D kind of, I don't know if y'all can see my little cursor here, but in, in that zone. And um, again, not too much happened, but then we fast forwarded a little bit and you can see this big jump up, which was finally when the comps turned positive. And it was just so silly because these comps had been bouncing around negative just for a little bit, although this company had an extremely strong history of positive comps over its life. Then when it turned positive, well, everything's okay again. At that same time, Cliff was uh, really doing a good job of, of actually working to sell this company. Um, he had multiple buyers and bidders engaged. And if you want to go read the kind of behind the scenes story. You can dial it up yourself on an SEC proxy, merger proxy that was filed. Um, and ultimately he um, found a good owner for this company in Rourke Capital, which is a private equity firm out of Atlanta focused on, on restaurants and franchising in general. And they got to what was a very fair price for this company that ended up being around 15 times EBITDA. The, the high end of that range. The EBITDA hadn't grown as much as we would have liked while we owned it, but that led to this stock, um, you know, ultimately selling at over $40 a share. And it was pretty interesting because when we invested originally, it was, you know, a heavily shorted stock. Um, and people would also wonder how liquid we would be if we own 15% of this company. <laughs> but when that deal was announced with Rourke, we were able to sell all of our shares in a day. And some of them we actually sold at more than the deal price just because uh, shorts were forced to cover. Um, so liquidity is very much a barbell. And when nobody wants it, you can usually get as much as you want. And when everybody wants it, you can sell a lot quicker than you think. Um, and you know, an interesting postscript to the story is that, um, you know, Cliff, Cliff and I have kept up since all this happened. and. You know, we hope that at some point in the future he would 
uh, go on a board at one of our investees or at least uh, give one of our companies advice. And that's kind of the circle of, of how we keep keep going, keep keep building uh, here at Southeastern. So um, that's it. I uh, hope I haven't talked too long here. I can only see a few of you on the side and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have right now. Uh, just uh, a quick question, I guess. I saw your, um, you got the big holding in uh, GE. Right um, now, now G was probably the most hated firm on the New York Stock Exchange uh, two or three years ago. Yep. Um, it is a vote of confidence for uh, Larry Kalp. Uh, it's funny because I like last year the, the conference was we, we canceled because of the of COVID. The keynote speaker was supposed to be Larry Kalp, and I asked him to talk about whether G is a value stock. And uh, so when, when do you buy your position? We bought it uh, two or three years ago, too early before Larry got there, unfortunately. But we did not give up in the darkest days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's still a key holding for us. It usually is the first stock we're asked about in, in most client meetings <laughs> to, the, to the loss aversion slide. You know, probably if you're a smart active manager who, who manages, you know, 40, 50, 100 stock portfolios, why would you want to own GE, right? Because you're going to have to talk about it all the time. But we feel like on business people price, this is an extremely high quality company where you've got a very strong position in aircraft engines. Of course, that's really hurt because of COVID. But long term, we love that position and it's going to get stronger. Then you've got a very strong healthcare, safe and steady division, and then a power division that's in the midst of a turnaround, but it services a third of the world's electricity. So that's that's not going anywhere either, ultimately. And then we think Larry is an extremely strong asset himself. His track record at Danaher, legendary. This guy could have had any job he wanted in corporate America. He comes back to run GE. We actually, I'm putting in a little plug for our, our podcast here. He'll be our next uh, podcast um, guest. Um, Staley uh, already interviewed him actually so stay tuned for that and, and they can do the story more justice uh, than I can um, and we put all this together into a spreadsheet that had you know again it was kind of like XOR like I talked about where they were it's it's not an easy stock to slap a multiple on and just be on your way and it doesn't pay a dividend uh, and there's some confusing accounting with GE Capital but the good news is all these things, even today, after all of that's happened with COVID, I mean, this this value is still significantly above the stock price, and we can see a path to significantly higher free cash flow per share. And uh, it's still consensus hated enough uh, so, so that this is not a popular opinion, and uh, we're, we're glad to own that one. So my question was, just going back to the business people price, um, have you ever had situations where you're analyzing a company and, you know, you think it checks all the boxes and then Later down the line, you realize, you know, maybe the business model or maybe the management wasn't as great as you thought. And how do you kind of then uh, go from there when you're in the middle of a position with them? Yeah, it, it depends a lot on what kind of wrong you are, <laughs> you know, uh, because that definitely happens. You know, as I mentioned, that that two out of five, we want it to be zero out of five. But, you know, we know that's probably impossible. Um, so the goal is to find it first as soon as you can that you're wrong and just know that, you know, face that reality and make it better. Now, if you're wrong about the business, usually there might not be much you can do about that. Um, you know, and that might be when it's, when it's time to sell, you know, if either there was some external event that changed the business or you yourself just misappraised its qualitative factors on the go in. And certainly that has happened before. But that's the kind of dangerous, uh, you know, the word value trap gets thrown about some. That's That can be what you want to avoid. Now, on the people side of things, if we're wrong there, but right on the other two, on business and price, then that's where we might get more engaged. And it depends, again, on what kind of wrong we are. You know, if this management team and board are very entrenched with super voting shares or, or something else, and we feel like we can't win, we're not going to bang our head against the wall. We're just going to move on to the next thing, and that might be a sale. But if we feel like we can improve the situation, either behind the scenes or publicly, that's where we step up our engagement. And that's where we've had a lot of wins over the years, you know, um, actually. 
So, um, yes, we, we don't like to be wrong, but when we do, we want to recognize it and, and, you know, change. You know, I've been reading a lot of articles lately that have been talking about this bubble that uh, we're in in the stock market. And, you know, I think a lot of uh, people are talking about, you know, how without FANGMA, the S&P would be either flat or going down. And I'd love to understand sort of your perspective on the bubble with the fact that the fact that everyone's talking about the bubble means that it's not going to pop. Um, there's sort of this weird dichotomy between if people know about the bubble, nothing's going to happen, but we're totally primed for this bubble to explode. So I'd love to hear what you think about that. Well, uh, I, I think you said part of it there well, where bubbles have to go on for longer than you'd think they would for them to actually be a bubble, <laughs> right? Like if somebody like just calls something a bubble day one, then it's probably not really a bubble. Um, but I will say this one has been going on a pretty, a pretty long time. And, um, you know, yes, I already talked about high multiples on high margins, especially for some of the favorite companies. Does that make something a bubble or not, or just overvalued? I don't know. Um, but then you start seeing things like, um, it starts getting even some of these like quali qualitative feel type things where today I, I saw that the third uh, different ETF made out of SPACs um, is, was filing to come to the market. Like, an ETF, like a SPAC ETF, that's 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 a little bubbly to me. Um, as, as are you know, multiple IPOs each day with big, huge first day pops, and everybody's trying to get in there. Um, it's that's the stuff that's like, okay, um, this this is this is starting to to definitely feel feel bubbly. Um, now you know they're. And I, I, I look back to the, the 2000 bubble. It didn't pop in one big, dramatic, great day where somebody magically decreed that now value is going to start working and the other stuff's going to stop working. It just kind of happened. Um, and I can't <laughs> exactly tell you how things are going to change here other than that simple math that I just talked about where the gap between uh, what we own what investors like us own versus what is in, you know, some of these market favorite indices. That's that gap does not persist forever because the classic Ben Graham quote about the market being a weighing machine in the long run, but a voting one in the short run. That's that's always going to be true, but it can be it can feel false for longer than you'd think. And that's why we just got to got to keep going out there. And, you know, I hear you when it when it feels strange, but um, I also can't tell you exactly when it's going to stop, but it will. Hi, Ross. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Uh, thank you for the presentation as well. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, you did mention cash flows. Uh, so wondering, uh, so, so it seems like, you know, technique to value the company is maybe like discounted cash flow. So. Uh, so why not like an asset-based approach uh, versus a cash flow approach? So that's number one. Number two, I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, like the rise of quantitative investing. So you've got uh, people like uh, Jim Simons. You know, I read somewhere that uh, they're they're averaging you know around like over thirty percent after fees. So so you know sort of what's your take on that? And uh, you do you did mention about uh, value sort of coming back into fashion. Uh, so in terms of that, like, do you think the pendulum is going to, uh, you know, like in how long the pendulum is going to swing back, you know? Uh, so yeah, that, that's my two questions. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start first on kind of the, uh, how we value things. We want multiple ways to, to value companies is, is the summary, you know, um, we're going to start though with the DCF because that's just fundamentally what a company is worth, how much cash it will generate over, you know, its life and you know adjust for leverage divide by shares and there you go but because we want to bring humility to the process and there are lots of different ways that dcfs can can go off the rails and might have <laughs> for some of the market favorites um again yeah it's it's a good way to say okay how does this compare to maybe not necessarily book value because a lot of the times that can be more of an accounting historical artifact We'd, we'd want to focus on replacement cost, or we'd want to focus on things like um, 
where M&A transactions, people who really put cash on the table uh, for a company in a privately negotiated deal where both sides got to see each other's numbers, what, what they paid uh, on the key multiples. And then we're going to look at what the stock market's saying. You know, like if we we own FedEx, we want to know what the stock market's saying about UPS or DHL. Um, and uh, it's not none of those things will be the end all be all, and there will be some judgment in weighing them all. But um, you know, you're right. We we want to bring more than one one thing to how we we value stuff. Um, in terms of quantitative investing, um, you know. It feels new, but it's not radically new. You know, you can go read, um, uh, you know, read the Jim Simons book. I mean, he's been around for a while. Read Ed Thorpe's book. Um, he he was doing this for a long time. Um, and it's not like, you know, computers are this this new phenomenon in the investing world. I mean, they were there um, in 1987. <laughs> they were there in 2000 uh, as well. And um, you know. There is definitely merit um, to to taking a dispassionate quantitative approach. I think that can be often one of quantitative investing's big benefits is that it minimizes some of these uh, counterproductive emotions uh, that I talked about. But at the same time, it's going to miss out on some of these um, companies that you know might have an underrecognized great leader at the helm or might have some kind of hidden uh, segments that are purely statistical accounting uh, for the assets might miss. Um, you know, we invested in, in DreamWorks in our small cap fund when it was a publicly traded company. Had a very valuable library of movies, but it wasn't generating much in the way of reported earnings or cash flow at the time we invested because they'd made a few dud movies. Well, how's a computer going to pick that up? It can be pretty hard to, uh, but Comcast knew what it was worth and ultimately you know, paid us twice what we paid. So we love those situations where human judgment uh, can can be our friend. Um, and that's why we think value investing will continue to work. These are complex systems. You know, people can't even predict the weather two to three weeks from now. And uh, to think that, you know, computers could, could overrun these things that have so much chaos and judgment involved, we think we're a long way from that. And I wish I could tell you that means value is going to work in exactly, you know, 37 days or something. Uh, but we, we just, you know, one of the good things about being a value investor is that you have an appraisal of what you think it's worth and you've done the work on, you know, the company's qualitative characteristics and you get to reassess those every day. And we just get to give, take what the market gives us. So. I was wondering if you could uh, share an example of um, a value name that you added to one of your funds that had like a compelling story at the beginning, but over time you realized that something materially changed and you ended up selling earlier than you had expected. And I'm just more interested in sort of the thought process behind that decision and also how the investment committee meetings went. Yeah, let me think about that. You know, something where the, the case kind of gradually changed on us and we ultimately sold um hmm. you know um trying to think back to one that's not too fresh you know um one uh well one you know this one is a little bit current i guess um <laughs> it's this company uh called uh Viasat that we'd owned for a while. We sold it last year, actually. Um, business people price originally, it was, um, you know, a, a mix of some different businesses that had a government um, a contracting and services business uh, that ultimately did very well and was worth more than we initially thought it was. It had a, a satellite broadband subscriber business that, that actually um, did all right as well. Um, and churn was reduced, price went up there, so cash flow from that. But as we continued to churn into this world where, you know, money was free and any startup got billions thrown at it, that led to more competition uh, for satellite constellations. And, uh, you know, as Tesla boomed last year, that led to more money for, for SpaceX. And 
we'll we'll see you know what happens with spacex's uh, constellation but the fact is it's got more money to to try and do more things against us competitively and amazon might enter as well in a way the case was kind of too compelling on satellite broadband and it it, it led in more and barriers to entry which we felt were and still are high have been overcome by a wall of free money <laughs> and management might have could have maybe made some some moves that were different and ultimately we decided you know what this is quite different COVID also um, didn't help their in-flight broadband business um, we've got a new government administration so we'll see what that means for the government business I hope they pull it out and um, lead you know the company to better days but ultimately things were just different than we th first thought they would be and this was a lot of talking over the years and talked with the board management other shareholders and just ultimately couldn't couldn't get there um so I'll leave it at that i was going through the q4 global fund commentary and i read that your team has formally incorporated esg analysis by mm -hmm. ranking companies on how they rate on esg factors so i'm curious to know how does your team integrate the modeling of esg risk factors in a portfolio management context. Thank you. Yes. So I will say that, you know, while we did write last year that we worked to formalize this, we've been doing this for a long time before it was called ESG. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that that our team has worked to, um, you know, again, put put more formal measures in place to, to work on this. But I've already talked a lot about the G, the governance how important that is to us, you know, partnering with owners who are good people who are going to do the right thing over the long term. It is very hard to put a number on <laughs> something like that and a, and a score uh, for, for human judgment and human track record and human incentives. And there's a lot of that where you kind of know it where you see it. Um, now, we, uh, you know, do subscribe to, to, MSCI and get their ratings, just like we subscribe to, to ISS and, and get their proxy voting recommendations. But at the end of the day, we need to make our own, you know, informed judgment about a company's ESG practices and about who we should vote for and not on, on, on a proxy. And we're never going to outsource something like that. And, you know, it's interesting. There have been studies about some of these MSCI, <laughs> Spanalytics, other rating services the correlations between them uh, quite low <laughs> so far. This is not like Moody's and S&P where they're always in this tight little band on each other. Uh, it's a lot of the ESG raters themselves are still figuring out <laughs> how, how, to, how to rate things and often we'll, we'll disagree and sometimes we'll agree, but we wanna just read and, 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 and take what they say with humility and sometimes it can be a great, great way to engage with the company and, and help them improve. Um, and the E and the S, you know, again, always been important to us. Um, we are never going to just take a big, huge uh, check the box or don't check the box approach to any given industry. We want to understand bottom up, you know, is this a good thing for society on environmental and social factors? You know, we've never gotten there on something like tobacco. Um, but then we'll own others that might, in theory, score um, not as highly as others would like on some ESG, on some ES metrics. Um, but if we feel this is a net benefit to society, um, then then we're there and we're going to help it be more of one uh, over the long run. But again, how you compare an alcohol company to a natural gas company to, uh, you know, a windmill company, um, we've owned all of those. <laughs> um, it can be really tough to, to put a number on that. And we would, you know, caution against thinking that that's easy to do. And um, in a way, we would think that over the long run, ESG and active value investing should go hand in hand, right? Both use um, just good, sound judgment to do the right thing for investors over the long term. And that's, that's how we hope to do it ourselves. 
Um, earlier, you asked a question, why doesn't everyone do this? And where a large part can it be attributed to like human emotion? So I'm really curious to hear what strategies have you personally employed and found especially effective to kind of maintain discipline and avoid, avoid falling victim to the prevalence of human emotion or human nature? Yeah, well, I think that um, I think there's part of it. You might just be born with it. <laughs> and that's not a very satisfying answer, right? Um, but, you know, when we're interviewing people, we'll often say, well, does this person, quote, get it? And, and that's a hard thing to, to you know, acquire over time. Um, so, so that's part of the answer, I guess, which is not really much of an answer. Uh, but then beyond that, you just want to kind of bring humility and curiosity to this whole thing, where you, it's this weird balance of having to be out there on your own saying that the market is wrong, often on a very controversial stock like a GE, like we talked about earlier. Um, whereas, you know, that takes some some guts. <laughs> but then you also want to keep talking with the team. And, you know, every day I'm talking to a different analyst and like, what, a, you know, give me a sanity check on this one. I, I feel like I might be missing something, but 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 you tell me. And then we have a very formal devil's advocate process um, that's not only at the start, but we've also got a formal process where we found 18 months is a key period if an investment's not working. And we'll do a review at that time and you know, maybe assign a new devil's advocate or we'll switch the analyst on a, on a stock. Um, it's, it's just, uh, that's, that's kind of how we don't get too set in our ways, but, but we also just, um, you know, we don't all have on CNBC at our desk <laughs> every day, and we don't actually talk really much at all to the sell side uh, analysts. We'll, we'll read their reports often, but we don't spend all day on the phone with these folks talking about next quarter's EPS because over the long run, that's worthless. We, we want to focus on what's important for the long run and while also balancing it with the acknowledgement that we could very well be wrong on some things and we want to find those as quick as we can. So, so it's a tricky balance between, between all of that stuff. And, um, you know, uh, another way to do it is just to study psychology. <laughs> and so that we're aware of these biases and, uh, we, we try to stamp them out as quick as we can. Um, I had a question regarding how you and your team view growth when assessing potential investments, because, on one hand, growth is inherently uncertain, and then on the other, uh, it tends to be one of the more um, obvious drivers of price appreciation. So I appreciate your thoughts. We want growth. You know, we, we want companies that are going to grow their free cash flow per share. Um, how we assess that can be a few different ways. I mean, again, it just starts with, is there a demand tailwind? for this product or service? Are people gonna want more of this one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Um, then we're gonna kind of wanna say, okay, well, who's gonna get that growth? You know, um, That gets to kind of the industry structure type stuff and also comparing uh, a company's products and services to others. And that's when we talk to users, we talk to competitors, we talk to suppliers and we say, okay, well, can this company be a market share gainer or a holder, or maybe if they're giving some market share, is that okay for some reason? It's often not, but you never know. It can be sometimes. Um, then we kind of start to look at, okay, if we start extrapolating out this growth, how reasonable is that? You know, there's a difference between kind of moderate GDP-ish type growth and then this super, you know, big double digit forever growth, because the law of large numbers starts getting you over the long run. And you've got to start looking at once you get to the five, 10 years from now, part of your DCF, that terminal value, um, how does that terminal value compare to replacement cost? Or, you know, what kind of return on capital are you effectively capitalizing in that terminal multiple? And if it's a big number, then you got to start asking yourself, well, yeah, this is what the DCF says, but is this reasonable? Is this something you would want to bet on for, for the long run. Um, so, you know, there's, again, I'm coming back to the balance thing where if you've got lower growth, you run the risk of going towards flatness or 
shrinking, which the stock market is going to hate and you're not going to get paid for. But you've also got a bigger margin of safety, probably, because your projections don't have to be too wild and out there, banking on things upon things happening. Whereas if you've got the higher growth, certainly it can can lead to a higher number in, in your multiple. But then you've really, really got to have a high level of certainty on out there into the future, which is very hard. <laughs> you know, many of the the things that, you know, if you'd asked us 15 years ago, what's what are some of the best businesses in the world? They're not anymore. And some of the best businesses in the world today weren't even in, invented back then. Um, so, and if we miss some of those, I guess maybe that's part of life as a value investor. Um, but it feels <laughs> it feels today like, um, you know, uh, that kind of, um, you know, the ease with which companies can grow profitably for a very long time might be being overestimated in, in a lot of instances. And, um, you know, we we feel like we we are in different parts of the market than, than some of those that are highly priced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam. Hey, hey Ross. Uh, thanks again for coming in. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, my one question was uh, towards the consideration, your consideration of portfolio sizing. So how does, how do you go about accumulating a position in a company? I understand that um, after you like, uh, like diligence a company um, and it becomes cheaper on your value distribution and it becomes an idea that you might want to invest in, but how do you go about uh, making that initial investment, but then also increasing your uh, position in that in that company. Yeah, well, we again we we do all the work on the front end to get to our appraisal and what we want to pay versus that appraisal, you know. And uh, generally, we're going to want to pay sixty something percent of what that appraisal is. And so, there's your discipline right there to start off. Is that you know if it's hanging out above that, we're we we will we know we've we've seen it enough times where you know, sometimes you get your price, sometimes you don't. And if you lose that discipline and, and start just trying to go get it no matter what, then you're not doing uh, the right thing for, for long-term investors. Um, and we've also learned over time that, you know, the newer we are to something, probably the slower we should go into it. You know, if this is a brand new company, industry, uh, people situation, maybe we'll start off small, two, three, something percent, see how it goes, and then see if we get a shot to, and this is talking about a standard 20 stock portfolio for us. If we should, you know, get some more confirmation before we go to 5% and if it's still really attractive, six or more percent. Um, on the other hand, if this is something that we know very well and we understand the people situation very well, we can act very quickly. Um, we bought uh, Yum Brands, when it was called, you know, a few other different names, when it was spun off from Pepsi uh, in the 1990s, and it was it was a good long-term investment for us. When it spun off Yum China, and we knew that situation very well, and it was going through some, you know, some out of favor market moments a few years ago, we didn't have to, you know spend a ton of time getting back up to speed on on something like that. So it's it's very case dependent, but we've learned, you know, that that patience pays over the long run. And patience also pays on the way out, you know. We we've learned that when you have that great 80 90 cent dollar that's growing, maybe don't be as as fast to sell that as we would have, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, I just have a question. I just saw on your global fund that you're invested in conglomerates and like based on like some of like the traditional finance classes they consider conglomerates having inefficient operations because they're kind of i guess they're kind of all over the place um like what is the rationale behind investing in like these conglomerates well i think that um definitely there are some conglomerates out there that have destroyed value and in a way the conglomerate structure kind of magnifies for good or for ill the value of your partners and what they're able to do. We love having John Elkan, uh, you know, helming the ship at XOR and magnifying um, that collection of assets that I talked about earlier. Um, look at Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, uh, 
the, those are, are good, you know, examples of conglomerate value building. Um, on the other hand, you know, you certainly want to avoid the empire builders who are just trying to play games to grow quarter to quarter EPS. And that's what rightfully the finance books would say are, are not good. Um, also, we've often found that when there's, you know, a conglomerate that's broken up into different parts and companies would initially be hesitant at that, they'll look back on it in a few years and say, you know what, this was the right thing because we were able to focus on these specific businesses more and we found more efficiencies and we were able to attract and retain talent better at these companies. Uh, so, so that's, that's another, another factor there that a lot of the times when you see us invest in a conglomerate, it might be because we think it can be deconglomeratized in a good way in, in the years to come, but it's this kind of hidden gem at the moment because nobody wants to go do all the work to understand this whole thing. When we invested in, in Liberty Media back over 15 years ago, I guess now, when there was only one Liberty Media, <laughs> you know, we couldn't tell you that there'd be so many other Liberty Medias today but we thought it was pretty likely. We thought that John Malone and then eventually Greg Maffei were pretty smart, smart guys who could figure out uh, how to build value for shareholders. And boy, they sure have. And we wish we would have owned more of those companies. So it's very dependent on the situation, but you are right to be wary of them. Thanks very much, Ross, for coming in. I wanted to know if you could chat a little bit about your framework or your approach for identifying competitive advantage. And then I was also curious if you had a favorite competitive advantage. Hmm. So, um, you know, we, uh, I talked about it a little bit, you know, there is definitely some, you know it when you see it to it, uh, but that's a pretty lame answer. Um, so, you know, we want to see uh, a good growing uh, return on capital, incremental capital. Um, we love hearing from, uh, you know, customers, competitors, suppliers, um, you know, back, for example, when we owned both Comcast and Disney and ESPN was riding very high, uh, we owned DirecTV then actually as well, um, you know, to hear somebody say that they, you know, feared how much ESPN could raise prices on them each year, that's a pretty strong <laughs> example of, of competitive advantage. Now, of course, things maybe changed a little bit with cord cutting and all that other stuff just showing again that, you know, it's very hard to predict great businesses, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the ones, the moats maybe that we're a little bit more wary of are those where the moat is a little bit more artificial. Um, you know, it's some government granted thing or it's some regulatory thing. Um, we like those moats where you just, you know, you can't recreate it. <laughs> you know, we invest in uh, uh, Williams, which is a, a pipeline company. They own this pipeline called Transco that goes from South Texas to New York City. You're not ever going to build that ever again. Uh, when we invested in Ferrovial and they had the 407 in, in the Toronto area, very high replacement cost uh, asset with very strong pricing power. Um, but something like just a moat that's like low cost, that's one that's not one of our favorites necessarily because uh, unless it's some kind of, you know, you know, natural type low cost situation, if it's the kind of low cost where you just got to grind it out every day, you know, like you see in retail world, that can kind of work until it just doesn't. Um, so all to say our favorite, I, I don't think I have a single favorite kind of moat. It would probably be some like tons of generationally long brand thing that you've seen tons of family members come through and not mess up. Um, you know, we own uh, this company in Mexico called Becla that has uh, Jose Cuervo tequila. It's been around since the 1750s. It's a pretty strong brand. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that it's hard to, Hard to rank that moat versus other moats, but again, you just kind of keep doing it and you know when you see it. Thanks again for speaking with us today. When you were talking about Sonic, you said that you spoke to their competitors for their advice. And I'm just wondering, is that a traditional practice 
of yours? And if so, how, how much do you value it? And then I have a second quick question. As a diehard AC Milan fan myself, I don't really appreciate your Juventus endorsement, but I respect it nonetheless. And if you, I'm just wondering if you met any of the Anelli family and what they're like. <laughs> well, I'll take the last one first. Um, uh, Josh Shores is our analyst on uh, XOR. And yeah, he, he knows, uh, has gotten to know John uh, over the years. Um, you know, I think they appreciate that we don't, you know, try to um, tell them who to sign or not sign in the, in the football world. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hear you on, on AC Milan and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but, but kind of back, uh, back over to, and now I just totally forgot your first question as I started thinking about XOR soccer. It was how with Sonic when you were talking to their competitors. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we want to hear kind of all levels of, of competitor. Um, you know, the executives themselves are, are, are really important. Um, you know, uh, again, we had gotten to know McDonald's management and had heard things they'd say about Sonic over the years. And it's nice to have heard those when we owned those companies too. <laughs> um, that's just kind of powerful, uh, again, unbiased. Um, we also, um, you know, don't just want the kind of high up executive view. We want to talk to people who are living it every day uh, at the franchisee level. Um, again, uh, you know, it was it was powerful to hear from guys who actually own a Wendy's, you know, across the street from a Sonic, for example. And they're going to say, well, you know, yeah, Sonic, uh, they're tough. You know, they have this strength in in drinks and desserts and I remember somebody kind of dismissively referred to it as like carnival food, but then they're like, but you know, it's kind of good carnival food and, and I like it. Um, so, so, you know, we, we just want to kind of learn as much as we can uh, from people and get as many types of input as we can. And uh, you, you're right. Sometimes when we talk to competitors, they might have their own agenda. Um, and sometimes they don't want to help us out and Hey, that's fine. You know, we'll go on to the next one on the list. Um but uh, you kind of learn how to weight these different types of feedback more or less over the years. The main thing is that we're, we're talking to people that we know we can trust and that we know have enough credibility and track record themselves so that they're not just kind of spouting off something they read in the newspaper, you know. In your Sonic example, you spoke about um, you look for confusing accounting. And I'd like to hear a little bit about, about your thought process there. And also, how do you manage the opportunities you see there with the risks that management might be trying to hide something from you? Yes. So when it comes to accounting, um, we, of course, we would also like it simple ourselves. <laughs> but if it were simple and readily apparent, here are the earnings per share. Here is what they will be next year. Here's what they'll be the year beyond that. Those are the stocks that are like at 30 times earnings right now. And we'll get to own those again. Uh, but we need a little chance for misunderstanding at a company. And that's that's where the confusing accounting comes in. What we love is when you look at the income statement and you're like, what is going on here? Um, and then you go to the balance sheet and you can see, okay, well, you know, there's not a lot of debt. Uh, there's not a lot of assets in this company. Okay, that's probably good. But then you go to the free ca the cash flow statement. And you're like, wow, this company is generating a lot of free cash flow. And then you go down the free cash flow statement and they're buying back a lot of stock and they haven't done a lot of silly acquisitions. The, you know, that's what we want to see where it's this income statement stuff um, obscuring the true value. And maybe that's some intangible amortization. Maybe it's a company has two segments and one of the segments is printing a lot of earnings and it's kind of a steady one, but there's this other kind of new fast growing segment that's currently losing money but it's an intelligent way that they're losing money because they're building up long-term value. You know, when we invested in Alphabet, for example, they hadn't even broken out their other bets segment yet, but we went and kind of did a bottom up look and we could see, you know, they're probably losing about $3 billion a year here. And that's pretty meaningful. And we should back that out of our valuation of search and YouTube. Um, that's the kind of bad accounting that we like. What we don't like are companies that have been just actively cooking the books to make their, income statements look fake clean, you know, where it's like, how does this company really grow so smoothly year to year? 
Um, and again, the cash flow statement rarely lies in that case. And if company has a nice clean income statement, but a dirty messed up cash flow statement, yikes. And if a company has changed its auditors around a lot, or if a company has gone through a lot of different CFOs, that can be a red flag. Um, I should have said we like confusing accounting instead of bad accounting, maybe. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much, Ross, for coming to speak with us. Uh, my question is basically um, why people, like your opinion on why people are so uh, critical of value investing. You know, like you see a lot of articles these days about, um, you know, whether value is dead or whether it's, you know, we need to reevaluate it and things like that. And, you know, every strategy has periods of time where it underperforms or overperforms relative to other strategies. And like value investing, you know, even has common sense on its side in the sense that you're buying companies that are, uh, that are cheap. And so I, I was curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. And then a second sort of follow-up is I've also read a lot of articles that tend to attribute this to the, you know, rise of, intangibles um, in terms of market, like as a ratio of market cap. Um, what are your thoughts on like, whether that has merit, like, you know, people are justifying an upward drift in like PE ratios over time uh, due to things like that. Do you sort of agree with that? Or um, do you think it's all sort of fluff? You know, um, to, to the first question, people, most people like what's been working. You know, most, most people want to get on the train and, and keep riding it. Um, and that's just kind of the human emotion thing. You were kind of preaching to the choir with common sense on why value should work. You should try to seek out bargains in life. Doesn't that make a lot of sense, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of people want to go into the casino and find that craps table where the guy's on a hot streak and go stand at that table, you know? Um, but again, over the long run, paying significantly less than something is worth when it's high quality. That's what we want to do. And that is, I mean, there are very few rolling 10 year periods over 200 years <laughs> of recorded data when that has not worked. We've just lived through one, you know, rel relatively. And to me, that's why I'm so excited about the next 10 years, because we've got hundreds of years of data of what we do works. And, you know, yeah, there were lots of not fun parts <laughs> of, of recent history, but that's what sets up for a good future, right? So so that's that's to the, the first question. To the intangibles, I, I don't know if I would subscribe to that one quite as much, because we have invested in a lot of companies like this uh, that have significant, you know, brand or intangible value. We love that, you know, because it usually means high returns on capital and some kind of a strong moat that nobody's been able to defeat yet. And uh, so does that mean that these companies are worth more than other companies that might be tethered more to hard asset values? Yeah, probably. Now, does it mean that some of these companies are worth 40 or 50 times earnings that aren't obscured earnings? Probably not. <laughs> so, so I think it was one of those that kind of like made sense early and now everybody's doing it late and, and they better watch out. As the CEO of a big value investing company, I'm curious, I don't know if you get to speak to Warren Buffett, but what questions would you want or do you have any questions you'd like to ask him? Or if you do speak to him, do you have any questions you'd like to ask Benjamin Graham, if he was here. Oh wow! Um, you know, I we don't own any Berkshire currently, and uh, you know, I've never met him. Uh, I've I've been to Omaha uh, <clears throat> to the to the annual meeting, um, and I've probably stalked him obsessively through his writings and his speeches. So I kind of feel like I know him. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of what I'd ask him, I feel like he's done so many things like you know, forums where he's answered questions and <clears throat> there's, there's not much left in a way. And I, I, that doesn't mean that I know everything about Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway. It's just kind of escaping me at the moment, you know, um, Ben Graham was, was such an interesting, uh, person and definitely less kind of, you know, less appearances on YouTube for Ben Graham. 
Um, but uh, so, so yeah, I bet I could find some interesting things to ask him. And he certainly had a, a more colorful life than, than Warren Buffett. Um, but, you know, it was interesting. I would, I would love it if Ben Graham, who kind of at the end of his life made some interesting quotes about how much harder value investing had gotten. And that was right at where it was about to be a great time for value investing, actually, uh, in the mid 1970s. So I, I'd love it if he came back and he, if he was like, well, you know, I might've been wrong on that one, or here's maybe why I was actually right. And here's why. 2021 might be different than 1975. Yeah, I'd love his take on that. I wanted to understand uh, that uh, most of us might not actually pursue value investing professionally in their careers. So I wanted to really understand as an individual investor uh, who wanted to follow the fundamentals of value investing, how would we uh, have that margin of safety? Because we don't get to speak with management. Uh, in your framework, we will we'll be able to understand really well the business. And the, and the price part, but the people part is pretty tricky uh, doing yeah. it offline. So I really wanted to understand like how to do that more efficiently and uh, become a successful value investor. Sure. Well, one way that you kind of get to quote talk with management is that there's so many kind of transcripts and again, YouTube clips out there on a lot of people that you can kind of get a sense for them that way. Then, you know, if they've been at a place for a while, you can look at their track record. Did they grow book value per share over the long term? Have they delivered for shareholders? They made smarter, dumb capital allocation moves. There's a lot you can can know, even if you don't get that, you know, audience with them, maybe like a, a larger uh, institutional investor would. So I wouldn't totally give up on being able to gauge people just from what's out there. Um, and the more you read through stuff, the more you can kind of get a sense of them through that. So I wouldn't give up on that basis. Um, but, you know, another way to come at it is to just say, you know what, I'm going to find some value investors who who I like, and you can either invest alongside of them or kind of see what they own and then say, well, you know, if that person checked out that management team, then maybe there's another vote of confidence for that person. But um, you're right, it's, it's, it can be a little harder in the individual investor's shoes, but doesn't mean it's not worth trying. Thank you, uh, thank you again for, uh, for being with us this evening. I'm sure uh, you're, you're getting tired at this point, so I'll make my question brief. Um, but just switching veins slightly, you know, um, from what I've read, like in the investment industry, um, success is said to, to hinge as much on the psycholo or psychological coaching of clients um, as it does on like having a sound investment strategy. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on how you handle uh, client relations at Southeastern, both like prospecting as well as like maintaining clients over time and really holding your hand through periods where value is, is in question. Well, first of all, as we have a great client team at Southeastern, uh, we actually had one of them listening here earlier. I don't know if Gwen is still on the phone, but she's in London and she's awake right now. She's definitely still a warrior, but that's an example of her dedication to, to value investing. Um, and so, you know, we, we make sure we've got great people on the team who, who understand what we're all about and who aren't in it for, you know, the quarter to quarter or the year to year. Uh, so that's very important. And then we ourselves, you know, have a history of closing our funds. Uh, when the time is right. And that's how you get the right kind of clients. Because if you just if you're just open all the time trying to get a bunch of fees, you're going to get people who are performance chasers. And they'll leave you when it's the wrong time. And they'll 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 come when it's the wrong time. And, you know, that gets back to that slide that we had about 17 year average client tenure. Um, we've 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 just tried to seek out the right kind of relationships at the right times. We've also just closed down entire strategies. We used to have a real estate fund, but we couldn't find enough cheap stuff for that strategy, so we don't have it anymore. Who knows if we'll have it again? But you know, it it will have to be something that we want to do with our own money. You know, again, this is not a game for us. We're our own largest client, 100% of our equity into this. We can't like hedge and go do some other thing. <laughs> like we we got to know this stuff. We got to do it. And, and the right kind of clients uh, respect that and want to want to get on board with that. And, um, you know, so so we're just, uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it's easy, unfortunately, uh, for, for everybody out there, especially this long into a rough stretch. But, yes, I am going to 
get on the phone with the client or get on a Zoom or go there in person and do my best to explain this is why we own these investments and, you know, please, um, you know, stick with us. And uh, we're very grateful for our clients. And it's, it's one of the better parts of the business when you, you know, deliver for clients after a tough time. And we're, we're ready for some of that. Before we close this uh, Zoom, I guess, uh, meeting, I'd like to ask a last question, which I normally ask uh, at the end of every speaker. Uh, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, what is the most important thing you learned in life and in investing over the last 15, 20 years? Hmm. You know, um, <clears throat> that is a tough question. Uh, I, th I think what I'd say on the investing side of things is that there is no one most important thing. And if <laughs> you go into investing thinking that you're ever going to get that, then you might not not be in the right right field because it's it's just a lot of kind of going through it every day staying disciplined staying curious staying humble and just going down that list and having the fortitude to <clears throat> to keep making it um so i don't have the one key to investing and i'm not sure if anybody does uh but then kind of on the life side of things <laughs> uh you know, I guess I think of instead of a quote or a lesson, I think of of a life maybe that that I admire that that sticks to some of those principles. Um, you know, I think of my my grandmother actually who who grew up during the depression. She lost a brother in World War II. She lost a husband to polio, and she kept going. And she was a great uh, elementary school teacher a great mom. And, uh, you know, she lived a great life. Uh, and it was not built on one single principle. She was just a very good person who was kind, who, who did her thing every day and everybody who ever came in contact with her loved her. And, uh, you know, so that's just kind of living a good life, I guess, um, is, is important and ultimately kind of its own, own reward in the end, I guess. Thank you all for the questions.